How do you know if you're ready to apply to medical school? Or how do you know if you're on the right track? What's up guys, Dr. Ryan Gray with another episode of Pre-Med TV. And today I wanna walk you through the process, my thought process, when it comes to talking to students, wondering what their chances are of applying to medical school this year, or wondering if they are on the right track. Now, a lot of students reach out to me through DM on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, SDN, so many places, and they ask me this question, am I on the right track? Am I doing everything right? Now, I'm gonna walk you through my thought process to really help you go through the same thought process and ask yourself, am I doing things right? Am I on the right track? When am I going to be ready to apply to medical school? Is it this year? Is it next year? Is it never? Let's talk about that right now. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to be notified of more great videos coming out here on Pre-Med TV. I'm excited to really talk about what we're gonna talk about today, but I'm more excited to talk about a lot of the thought process that goes into what I do. I'm packaging all of that and we're creating Mapped. If you go to mapped.com, that's M-A-P-P-D, the E was too expensive, M-A-P-P-D.com, and sign up to be notified when that comes out. Mapped.com is a new technology platform that I'm hoping will completely level the playing field for every student. So let's go ahead and jump into the conversations that I have with students. The first place I start is a general interview question, right? Tell me about yourself. I wanna know who they are and what is motivating them just in their life, not necessarily medicine yet. I'm not asking that question yet. I wanna know just who they are right off the bat. And that conversation will give me a lot of information about what drives them, what motivates them, what makes them tick. It's the same reason why medical school admissions committee members and interviewers ask that question on your interview day. They wanna see what comes to the top of your mind when you're discussing yourself. So I just start with a basic thing. So as you're doing this exercise at home, you can just say, like write out on a piece of paper or type on the computer, just a little bit about yourself and see where that leads you. Is it leading you down, I'm this major, I'm this year, I do this research, I've done these extracurriculars, or does it lead you more down the path of just who you are and what you enjoy doing in your life? That's the, the path that I like more because it leads to more conversations. So that's just a general place that I start. Next, I really wanna find out what their motivations are for going to medical school. Now, sometimes I've read a personal statement at this point, sometimes I don't have anything. I wanna hear out of their own mouth why they want to be a physician. And this is really important because when you've been doing this long enough, you start to pick up clues as to whether or not this is the path that they are choosing for themselves or that they are choosing for someone else. Now, not that long ago, I had a conversation with a student, uh, a young female, uh, and she, after a long discussion, reading her personal statement, there was just something missing in her personal statement, something missing just talking to her. And so we, we kept on talking and the end of the conversation led to her being in tears, really just understanding that she didn't want to be a physician. This was not her dream. And I asked her, I said, if you could be anything right now, what would it be? And she said, a vet. So I said, have fun, go be a vet. That's amazing. I'm glad you figured that out. So you stop wasting money down this pre-med path and you can go down the vet path. And unfortunately, it's still a very expensive path, but still, that was her dream. Those were her passions, not medicine. She was following medicine for someone else. So you have to really make sure that you're doing this for yourself, not for money, not for fame, not for stature. There are so many other things in life that you can be doing for all of those things outside of medicine where you don't have to go into a ton of debt to become one, a ton of heartache to become one, and a ton of hard work to become one. So make sure you're doing this 
for the right reasons. Now, obviously, one of the two biggest factors in determining whether or not you're ready to apply to medical school is the MCAT. The MCAT and your GPA are two huge factors to determine if you are ready to apply to medical school. Now, a lot of you would say, well, GPA and MCAT will tell you if you can be a doctor, and that's completely false. Your GPA and MCAT right now, as I'm talking to you, what your GPA and MCAT are right now can't dictate if you can become a doctor. Where you can go from here is what will dictate if and when you can go to medical school. So I have the conversation about the MCAT. Have you taken it yet? When are you planning on taking it? If you're retaking it, what went wrong the first time? What are you doing differently now? And I have really hard conversations with students. They've, if they say, look, I, I took it and I really wasn't prepared. I didn't really know what was involved with the MCAT. I just took it. I didn't take any practice tests. I just read a book. I was a good student, so I thought I would do well. I ended up with a 490. So I say, okay, now you know that the MCAT is different. What are you doing now to make sure you don't repeat the prior mistakes? How many practice tests are you planning on taking? Are you reading a different set of books? Are you reading the same set of books? Are you planning on doing a course? Those things don't dictate your success, right? It's the planning and execution of that plan that dictate your success, whether you're planning on self-studying, studying in a group, using a course, whatever that may be. But I wanna hear the plan from the student. And if a student says, well, you know what? I, I was gonna start studying right now because I'm planning on taking it in, in March, but I, I just haven't started yet because of this and that and this and that. And I'm also taking classes and I'm worried about my grades. Then I say, okay, you don't have to take the MCAT right now. You can delay the MCAT. Yes, it'll push off your application, but it may be a better option for you. And so we go through those options, those questions, that line of thinking. Where are you now with the MCAT? When are you planning on taking it? Have you taken it before? What's different this time? Those are really important questions for yourself. If you've taken it, what are you doing differently? Prove you wrong, right? The, the first test that you took, if you're a retaker, the first test that you took, Prove yourself wrong that that is not who you are, that you are better than that score. MCAT and GPA are very important for medical school. They have to be up to a certain level to get in, right? They have to be up to a certain level to be reviewed. They have to be up to a certain level to be invited for an interview. I always talk about you have to be good enough, and that's what I mean. You have to be good enough to get to that next level. So. We have that discussion about the MCAT. And sometimes those are hard discussions too. People aren't willing to put in the time. People can't put in the time. So many things that can go wrong with the MCAT do, and people are potentially considering pushing back the MCAT or saying, you know what? The MCAT is not my deal. I don't wanna take it. I'm gonna go a different path. And I was actually very similar to that. I took the MCAT once, I applied. I didn't get in that first time. And I said to myself, if I don't get in this second time, I don't know if I'm gonna be a doctor because that MCAT, I hated it. And luckily I got in the second time so I didn't have to, to worry about that. So the next big thing obviously is the GPA. Your GPA and MCAT are used to determine your academic capabilities of getting through medical school of passing your boards the first time you take them, of doing well in your residency tests that you're going to have to take. Yes, the tests don't stop once you graduate medical school, unfortunately. So the medical schools need to make sure that you are academically capable. You are quote unquote smart enough to, to get through medical school. That is the point of GPA and MCAT screening and cutoffs and whatever else you wanna call it. The medical schools need to make sure that you are going to get through medical school. That's the whole point of medical school, to get you through to become a physician. And so we talk about GPA and they'll say, well, I have a 3.2. I say, okay, well, I don't know what that means. Is it a 4.0, 4.0, 2.0, 3.5, whatever that math works out to be? I don't know. I have the students go to whatsmygpa.com. It's a, a calculator for free on my website. Again, that's whatsmygpa.com and they fill it out. 
And we're excited Maps will have a, a fancier calculator. It'll have a lot of built-in bells and whistles that'll make uh, tracking your grades and courses and GPA so much better. And it'll also give you some of this feedback built in to the software. Again, that's mapped.com without the E. So you, I, I have them go to whatsmygpa.com. They send me the screenshots or the, the actual website itself so I can see their trends. If they're a student who has struggled, like guests on my podcast, I chat on my podcast, episode 230 of the pre-med years. If you go to premedyears.com slash 230, Chad was a student at BYU for undergrad. He didn't do very well. He was a post back student at, NY, er, at BYU. He didn't do very well. He finally realized why he wasn't doing well. And it wasn't because he wasn't destined to be a physician. He's in medical school right now, earning all kinds of awards and scholarships because he's awesome. He didn't do well in undergrad because he was supporting a family. He didn't do well in post back because he was supporting his family. He was working and trying to be a student. It wasn't until he had the hard conversations with his family and with his wife that he realized that he needed to step away from making money to focus on being a student. His family went on different social services to be able to live, to sustain their, their family. And he proved that he was a good student. He just needed the time to dedicate to being a student. Now, a lot of you are lucky. You're, you're younger, you don't have families, you don't have any obligations. Maybe you're getting some support from your family. Whatever your situation may be, whether you're a 4.0 student or a 2.0 student, the student really, at the end of the day, needs to prove that they can be a good student. And Chad was able to do that Finally, in an SMP, where he was able to take out loans, pay for the master's program, and not worry about working and supporting his family at the same time. And because of his success in the SMP and his, his work on the MCAT, oh, did I forget to tell you he was also rejected from Caribbean medical schools, which usually never happens? But yeah, he was rejected from the Caribbean medical schools. But ultimately, he was accepted, I believe, to two... DO schools and DO schools because they are usually very forgiving about past mistakes and past performance. And they looked at his most recent stuff and said, hey, like you are the type of person we want. And as I mentioned, he's doing amazing in school. He's winning awards, winning scholarships. I see his picture all the time on social media, celebrating something new that is happening to him. His prior performance didn't dictate whether or not he was going to be a good medical student. His prior performance did not dictate whether or not he was going to be a good physician, whether or not he was going to be a good medical student. And that's why I completely disagree when an advisor will tell a student like Chad to not go to medical school, that they can't go to medical school. He just needed the time and space to figure it out and prove that he would be a good student. He wanted to be a physician. Let him prove it. Another student, Satonye, who I had on the podcast not that long ago, episode 370 of the pre-med years, almost the exact same as Chad, was working and supporting herself through all of her schooling, could never prove that she was a good student. She had so many other obligations. And it wasn't until she did a master's where she had loans to pay for school and to help support her and put a roof over her head that she was able to prove that she is a good student. And now she's a, a medical student at an MD school, I believe, in Connecticut, I believe. So episode 370, go check it out. Um, just really, I go down this path of, okay, where are you? Are you struggling with your GPA? Do you have a negative trend? Are you all over the place? Have you had some missteps? Have you had some life events that have screwed things up? Where are we now? I can't answer whether or not you can get into medical school, especially if you're starting off on the wrong foot. But where can we get to if this is what you really want? This is the work that you're going to have to put in. And those are the conversations that I have with students. I then work through the other basics, right? What are your extracurriculars? Do you have clinical experience? Do you have shadowing? Do you have research? Do you have any volunteering? And remember, a lot of, a lot of students get confused with clinical experience. Clinical experience can be paid or volunteering. It doesn't have to be volunteering clinical. It can be anything. So if you're an EMT, if you're a nurse, 
that's great. There are some schools that still like volunteering kind of separately, like Habitat or the soup kitchen, stuff like that, non-medical, non-clinical volunteering. But we'll go down that list. What does that look like? Not only in total hours, but in recency as well. So as you're evaluating yourself, right? We've evaluated just kind of who you are. We've evaluated your MCAT score, your plans to get a good MCAT score. We've evaluated your GPA. Now let's look at your extracurriculars. So write down shadowing, write down clinical experience, write down, and those are separate, right? Shadowing is not clinical experience. Write down research, write down volunteering, write down leadership. Those are all things that you should be thinking about when it comes to making yourself not only well-rounded as an individual, but really painting a picture of who you are when it comes to applying to medical school. I don't want you to think of these as checkboxes. I don't care what you're doing to fulfill some of those categories. I just care that you're doing something that you enjoy, that you're passionate about, that you're following because you want to do it, not because you're trying to check off a box. Right? If you're proving, trying to prove to yourself and prove to medical schools that you want to be a physician, something would tell me that you would put yourself around physicians because, hey, I wanna be a doctor, I love the hospital, I love that environment, I love in, being in the clinic, whatever that may be. And that was a big thing missing from my application was really a lot of that experience. When I was in school a long time ago, uh, I really didn't understand those differences. I had a bad pre-med advisor who told me not to apply to medical school for, for other reasons outside of grades and an MCAT score, but uh, I, so, so I was navigating this process myself and I didn't understand the, the importance of clinical experience, the importance of shadowing. I just, like many of you said, hey, I've always wanted to be a doctor. I'm going to be an amazing doctor because I'm awesome. So you should accept me. That's what a lot of applications to medical school look like. And Ultimately, at the end of the day, you need to prove to yourself, you need to prove to the medical schools that this is what you want. And you do that through your activity list. You can show a lot about who you are in your activities, telling those stories we talked about uh, in a recent video about how to write those extracurriculars. But you can really focus on who you are and painting that picture. So let's start with clinical experience. Have you put yourself around patients? Now there are lots of questions. What is clinical experience? Is pharmacy tech clinical experience? Is this clinical experience? Is that clinical experience? And at the end of the day, a million of you are gonna ask, and, and ultimately at the end of the day, the answer is, what did you do? I can't tell you if it's clinical experience or not just based on the title. What did you do and how did it impact you? So if you were around patients, if you were interacting them in something more than an administrative way, like uh, a student who tried to say that registering patients in the emergency room was clinical experience, I said, no, that's more like front desk experience in a clinic that's admin, that's not clinical experience. It's great experience, but it's not clinical. So you have to ask yourself, what am I doing? Am I interacting with patients in a more than administrative way and maybe a little bit more clinical way. It doesn't mean you're the one suturing, you're the one putting on a cast. It doesn't have to be that side of it. A long time ago, uh, I think it was a John Hopkins Adcom member said, if you're close enough to smell the patient, that's clinical experience, right? And there's always some caveats to that. Same thing with shadowing. What are you doing with shadowing? Both clinical experience and shadowing are important. Clinical experience more than shadowing is important because you are actually doing more through clinical experience than shadowing. Historically and kind of classically, shadowing is a very passive experience. So I want you to be more active. That doesn't mean you check off a box and you get your 50 hours of shadowing and call it good. I was just reviewing an application recently and a student said, I'm really concerned about my 50 hours of shadowing. That's all I have, especially with COVID going on. I, I can't get any more. And I said, well, 50 hours is probably fine. And then I find out that the 50 hours was four years ago. And then I'm like, ooh, maybe that's, that's a little bit more of a red flag. Really, ultimately, there's nothing to do about it right now because of COVID and everything else. So let's apply and, and hope that schools are okay with that. Recency and consistency are very important when showing that this is what you want to do. 
Now, it doesn't mean you're consistent in doing the same thing, right? If you're an EMT and you really hate being an EMT, you did it just to check off that box and you're like, I can't stand this, right? Go and find something else to do. I'm not telling you that you have to be stuck in something that you don't like doing, but find something else, hopefully clinically related or shadowing or whatever. And that doesn't mean 20 hours a week. It means five hours a month, right? That's consistent and hopefully recent as you do it over a long period of time. Now, obviously with COVID and everything else, people are gonna have gaps in their experiences. There's no issue with that. Schools obviously understand that that is happening and that the applications this year, next year, for a few years are gonna look a little weird with this gap in the middle. Don't worry about that. But ultimately what I don't want you to do, and I, I was talking to some students at a conference a couple of years ago and they said, oh, Dr. Gray, we have this plan. We're, we're gonna bang through our shadowing this summer. We're gonna get like 100 hours of shadowing and then move on so that we can then focus on the next thing, right? And they're treating it like a checklist and the medical schools can see that, the reviewers can see that and they'll go, this student may be a great student, but is treating this whole process like a checklist and I'm concerned that they don't know what they're getting themselves into other than checking off a bunch of boxes. And those types of students may have a hard time getting into medical school. And you'll see it when you look at the AAMC data, there are great students stat-wise who aren't getting into medical school. And I guarantee you a lot of those students likely are doing checklists. I talked to a student, 3.9 GPA, 519 MCAT score, no interview invites, nothing. Her personal statement read completely boring. She had no idea what being a doctor was like. She had no shadowing, no clinical experience. She wasn't invited for an interview. I'm telling you, it is more than stats. So we go through this process, right? Shadowing, clinical experience, not just total hours, but recency and consistency. Any research, if they don't have research, great, not a huge problem. There are so many schools out there that will accept you without research. They just want to see your curiosity level, see where you are inquisitive in your nature. And there are plenty of other opportunities to show that if you don't have research. If you want to try research, great, go try it. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. I did a little bit in college. I liked what I was doing. I tried some other research that I didn't like doing. I stopped that, but I ultimately liked what I ended up doing for a little bit of time. We talk about other volunteering, right? Are you are you doing going to the soup kitchen? Are you going to Habitat on weekends? What are you doing for other volunteering? So we go through all of that. And I really use all of that. I, and I, I wanna make a picture at some point really showing that you have to have all of these key components of being a really good medical student for everything to work. It shows that you're well-rounded. It shows that you know what you're getting yourself into. It shows that you've exposed yourself and that you like everything that you're getting yourself into. It shows that you're a good human being willing to sacrifice some weekends to go build some homes for people in need. Those are all very good traits, right? Especially right now, you see it. We're in the middle of this pandemic and doctors are being called to volunteer their time to go to these epicenters and work to volunteer. Doctors are getting their pay cuts. Doctors are being furloughed. Doctors are being fired and, and New York City is saying, hey, come volunteer in our city. We need you. Doctors are very historically treated as very selfless people. They are expected to give a lot of themselves. Now, I don't agree with all of that kind of thinking, but a lot of it I do agree with. And it's a very trying career that requires a lot of sacrifice. And so medical schools want to see that you're willing to make that sacrifice, not only for the future, but also for medical school and residency. They want to make sure that you're going to sacrifice your Friday night out with your bros so that you can go and study and hopefully do well on your test. And then I round out the conversation really just with a general idea of what they're hoping to accomplish. Where do they want to go? Are they a 3.0 student with a, a 502 MCAT score? And they're like, I want to go to Harvard. I want to go to Duke. I want to go to Yale. And I say, whoa, 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 right? If you really want to go to those schools, great. But let's have a more honest and serious conversation, right? Those are amazing medical schools that are competitive for everyone. They're looking for really top tier people, top tier students. What is in your application that makes you think they will want you? And so we work through it. And maybe there is something in their application where I say, okay, your stats are lower, but they may really want you. So let's let's give it a shot. 
but we really work through where are they state resident, are they applying to out-of-state schools, are they public, are they private? So working through that school list and getting an idea of what is an honest school list versus what is kind of out there. And we talk about DO, I say, are you really specific on your preference in location? If you're more location specific, then let's look at all the schools, MD and DO. If you're very degree specific, which I don't think most students should be, but if you're like, I, I only want to be an MD, that's all I want. I don't want to be a DO. I'm great. No judgment. I don't agree with it, but I don't judge you for that. Uh, and, and I talk about why they they want to only be an MD. And most of the time it's because they have they don't know anything about DOs, but that's that's uh, education that can come elsewhere. So we talk about that. Do uh, A lot of students are only applying DO right now because the, the DO kind of world and philosophy and everything else is kind of going up. And so a lot of students are thinking about that as well. So we go through that whole process. And that's ultimately my process when I talk to a student and really trying to understand where they are at in the process. And we look through it. And it's very similar to how a medical school will look at your application. Medical schools, a lot of times, will use a rubric and say, okay, GPA, where are they? They get this number of points for their GPA. MCAT score, okay, they get this number of points for an MCAT score. Extracurriculars, diversity of extracurriculars, total number of hours, recency of hours, they get this number of points for their extracurriculars. What does their personal statement say? They get this number of points, right? It's a whole process that application or admissions committees rather use to look at your application to determine whether or not they want to invite you for an interview. Hopefully that was helpful. Again, a lot of what I just discussed is what I do one-on-one -on -one with students. And I don't like doing one-on-one. -on -one. I love doing one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't like doing one-on-one -on -one for a lot of reasons. And that's why we're making mapped. And, and the software, you will be able to go in and track all of your hours, track your grades, track your MCAT scores, enter in a ton of stuff. And the software will eventually get to a point where it can give you some feedback through the software. So you don't have to pay a high price for a consultant or an advisor like me, or you don't have to go to your advisor at your school if you don't like them. And, and that's the first place I recommend you go is to the, your school advisor. But if you've had bad interactions, if they they tell you to have a plan B and, and go, uh, go, go do something else because you'll never get into medical school because you got that C in Orgo, whatever it may be, right? Mapped.com. Go sign up to be notified of everything we're doing. I'm so excited for everything we're working on at Mapped, and I hope you come along with us for that journey. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on Pre-Med TV.